let's talk about intermittent fasting. So you mentioned that there could be intermittent fasting with calorie restriction and intermittent fasting without calorie restriction. So maybe you can discuss the difference and whether or not both are effective at improving insulin sensitivity. Yeah, so uh, so mostly, it, let's talk about first intermittent fasting. Um, so I assume your audience knows what intermittent fasting is, but it can really vary, right? Um, generally, we think of inter- intermittent fasting as maybe the 8-16 diet or 16-8 diet where you are fasting 16 hours of the day and eating 8 hours a day. Um, uh, but people do this differently. Sometimes people have restricted, dramatically restricted calories, let's say two days a week. They fast maybe two days and then they eat normally the other days. Um, So intermittent fasting can come in a variety of flavors. Um, In terms of uh, studies done on intermittent fasting, basically there have been small clinical trials done. And in small, and uh, let's also say that in small uh, clinical trials, um, it's always been the benefit has been with calorie restriction because generally um, people were reducing their calories, let's say 60%. But I want to be very, very clear about this. The scientific community is undecided um, regarding intermittent fasting in humans. We just haven't done enough large randomized clinical trials to definitive be able to tell, definitively be able to tell you the benefits of intermittent fasting with calorie restriction, without calorie restriction, exactly attribute the benefits to the calorie restriction or to the fasting, meaning just eating all of your calories in a period of specific period of time versus how many calories you're eating in a specific time. So I want to say that that has not been uh, completely sussed out in, in uh, clinical trials and literature. There have been small uh, clinical trials and Certain, you know, fasting regimens like intermittent fasting with restricted eating have shown benefit for sure um, for weight loss and improved uh, insulin resistance and also reduction of risk factors for, let's say, cardiovascular disease. Um, Some of these, uh, there have also been trials done in, you know, mostly animal models um, and mostly the benefits of intermittent fasting are attributed to the calorie restriction. So that is why you have the various benefits that you're getting. So that generally the benefits that you think of from, uh, from intermittent fasting are the ones that you generally think of from weight loss, which are you know, reduction in insulin uh, concentration and improvement of like lipid levels and reduction in inflammatory factors. That's kind of what you're, you're getting. So how does it happen? Basically, there have been one of the some of the research has shown that um, basically intermittent fasting induces a metabolic switch where we shift metabolism from lipid cholesterol synthesis and fat storage to mobilization of fat through fatty acid oxidation and fatty acid derived ketones, basically pres- preserving muscle mass and function. That's kind of what we're doing. So uh, I don't want to call it, you know, the Atkins diet, but that's kind of. Um, one of the things that that happens when this mechanism goes into effect. Um, So you get, as a result, improved body composition in overweight individuals, um, which, you know, uh, promises to be kind of slow down the aging and disease process. Um, So in terms of, um, in terms of the the, like I mentioned, there isn't, um, you know, I, I do want to mention something else, which is the, the circadian rhythm. There haven't, it is believed that if you really want to perfect kind of the intermittent fasting process, you should also be cognizant of your circadian rhythm of, and when you should be eating, when should that window be? And generally you want to align that window with your uh, with your awake and sleep times, with when you are most active, you want to consume those calories that eight hour around the time that you are most active uh, during the during the day. Because um, you know, uh, so many things affect your metabolism, your sleep and wake times, your light, you know, light and darkness, amount of food that you're ingesting, the timing of the food, your activity levels, your body temperature, how old you are. Um, and uh, 
so, so generally you want to think about your intermittent fasting regimen to sort of be aligned with, with these things. But of course, with people with diabetes, um, they have, you know, what is called this dawn effect. Sometimes they have this morning, you know, their glucose is higher during sort of the morning. So when that's the case, you, you may not want to feed it more, you know, more, more, more food. So I think more studies need to be done for uh, impact of um, intermittent fasting for people with diabetes specifically um, to try to understand um, that impact. And also more studies should be done to see the benefit of sort of the circadian rhythm or coordination with circadian rhythm and intermittent fasting. And uh, like I said, attribution of calories versus no calories to the benefits of intermittent fasting. So we definitely need to do we need to do that. What is believed, though, is in general, no matter how many calories you're going to have, have it in a smaller window. So even if we don't talk about calorie restriction, you're just talking about simply just eating the way you're eating. That's fine. Still try to pull all of those calories into a smaller window. That, that would definitely be, you know, some studies have shown that that does have uh, benefit. Um, so, uh, like I said, people disagree on whether calorie restriction is required because not enough studies have been done, but um, uh, we definitely want to try to pull all the calories people are eating into a smaller benefit. But you, you definitely see health benefits in terms of lower body weight, in terms of lower concentration of triglycerides, glucose, low density lipoprotein cholesterol, and increased concentration of, of course, high density lipoprotein cholesterol, which is your good cholesterol. Um, so I'm a big fan. It's made a huge difference for myself um, personally. And um, I now, uh, you know, I used to think that if I didn't eat breakfast at 8 a.m., I was going to, you know, I was going to die, like something terrible was going to happen. But fortunately, um, nothing's happened. My new regimen is I wake up, I don't eat anything. Um, I wait until I take my fiber. After I take my fiber, um, uh, then I wait for an hour, hour and a half, or maybe two hours, and then I'll have my first meal of the day, and then I'll have another meal. Um, hopefully, you know, I'm, I work a lot, so unfortunately, I don't get to just eat when I want to necessarily. Sometimes I'm still in meetings um, when I should really be eating, but um, then I try to have my second meal not too, not too, late, in the few, not too late in the evening. And, you know, there is some research also around the last meal sleep gap. You really don't want to eat um, later than, uh, you know, or you want to, you want to have a three-hour gap between your last meal and your sleep. Um, I don't know how you guys, like Robbie Cyrus, how do you guys sleep if you eat late? Um, has, does that make yeah. a difference for you? Definitely. It, it, I can feel it. Uh, it actually definitely disrupts the, uh, the quality of my sleep. So I, I'm the type of guy that I, you can literally play the drums in my room and I will still fall asleep. Yeah. But just because I can fall asleep quickly does not mean I'm going to stay asleep and doesn't mean that I'm going to have uninterrupted sleep and, you know, multiple REM cycles throughout, you know, a six to eight hour period. So personally, I have experienced that when I eat late, uh, that it causes this like circadian disruption is really effectively what it is. Totally. I also totally. find that for people living with type one diabetes, eating late makes it harder to manage your blood glucose levels. Uh, when you can sort of eat well before you go to bed, let that fast acting dose run its course, stabilize where you're at, and then um, basically have a steady blood glucose overnight. It's super helpful. No yeah, doubt. Have you, now, heard, um, have you heard they say overnight your your pancreas goes to sleep and your liver takes over, and so you're almost like everybody's diabetic overnight. You just just eating late at night is just such a bad idea, um, and it is. and of course um, many of us are used to like snacking all the way uh, to when we go to sleep. So you know restricting those calories, whenever however many calories, if you restrict them and you eat them, you know with a three hour gap between that last meal and sleep is a really good idea. It's an easy habit that people can really adopt. I think intermittent fasting, the last meal sleep gap of at least three hours, 
um, adding a lot of fiber to your to your foods are really honestly easiest ways of changing your lifestyle that have long lasting uh, impact on your insulin resistance, on your underlying physiology, and underlying health. They're really easiest levers of health. No doubt. Now, um, back in 2009, when I was uh, studying at UC Berkeley, we performed a number of experiments. So basically, I spent five years studying the effects of calorie restriction and or intermittent fasting. And the reason I say and or is because, like you had mentioned earlier, when you're calorie restricted, you're calorie restricted. You are literally taking on less calories than your ad lib fed counterparts. But when you are intermittent fasted, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're calorie restricted because you can perform intermittent fasting where you get uh, the same number of calories as your control subjects and totally. you can perform intermittent fasting where you are calorie restricted. 100%. Now, we, we published multiple papers on this topic and we were using mice and rats as our sort of uh, exactly. as our experimental model. That's mm -hmm. just the way it is. And, uh, even though these experiments happened, happened in, uh, rats and mice, uh, I don't want people who are listening to this to think that, oh, well, this doesn't apply to humans because the physiology from small mammals, um, from small rodents is highly conserved with humans. So they're sort yes. of like a great test model for understanding what happens in humans. So in 2009, we developed, so you know this, correct. Yes. So we wrote this paper that, that talks about how calorie restriction actually uh, dramatically changes the way that fatty acid synthesis and fatty Absolutely. acid oxidation happens. And it's very measurable and it's very noticeable. Absolutely. So um, one of the papers that we published back in 2009 actually demonstrated here that within two days of calorie restriction being initiated in uh, laboratory mice, what we noticed was that there was a fundamental shift in the way that these animals were utilizing the food that they were provided. So they were calorie restricted by approximately 25%. And what we found is that when they consumed their food, mm -hmm. they knew that there wasn't much food available. And so it was this foraging type behavior where they would see less food, they would eat the food, they would eat it way faster, like way faster than their ad lib counterparts. And as a result of consuming the food, even though it was less food, as a result of consuming it faster, it changed the way that their digestive system and their liver processed the nutrients inside. So what we saw is that within the first six, four to six hours of eating 25% uh, less food, mm -hmm. uh, what ended up happening was that their liver actually took in a lot of those nutrients and then ended up uh, converting, or sorry, it ended up taking in a lot of the glucose, okay? On, and this is a low fat diet. Let me also say that. Ended up taking in a lot of the glucose from the carbohydrates that were present inside of that meal. And then what it would do is uh, it would send that glucose out into the blood and that glucose would then make its way into uh, adipose tissue. And in the adipose yeah, tissue, exactly. there was basically, sorry, let me back this up. There was a conversion of glucose to fatty acids inside of the liver and those adipose tissues, would, those, those fatty acids would end up living and being exported and, tr and, and uh, transported to the adipose tissue. So in other words, their, uh, within the four to six hours after being fed this food, their liver went into the state of de novo lipogenesis where they were making a significant amount of fatty acids. And then those fatty acids were sent to the adipose tissue. And then that served as the reservoir for them to basically, that was their fuel depot for the rest of the 18 to 20 hour period. And so you could see this where there was a lot of fatty acid synthesis initially, and then a whole bunch of fatty acid oxidation right afterwards. These That's animals exactly ended up losing right. weight. And it was, it was a really cool way to observe that you can actually change the way that fuels are used simply by manipulating the total amount of calories present in any given meal. Exactly confirming what you're saying that essentially by doing intermittent fasting, we are, you know, pushing this button, uh, this metabolic switch, if you will, where we shift from met metabolism and lipid cholesterol synthesis and fat storage to instead mobilization of fat through fatty acid oxidation Angle. and fatty acid derived ketones. It's exactly what we're doing. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's so exactly right. That's why and so people are always wondering, you know, how, how is it possible that you end up losing weight when you're, when you're calorie restricted? Well, it's, you know, partly due to this, you know, change in lipid metabolism that occurs in the calorie restricted state, whereby the fuel that is literally sitting inside of your adipose tissue, these fatty acids that are designed to be a fuel to be, to, uh, to, to, uh, that can be oxidized over the course of time, they become the Costco warehouse of energy. 
And so when there's less fuel available inside of your food, then all of a sudden you don't have no choice. Your adipose tissue becomes the reservoir and those fatty acids get exported and they start to get utilized by other tissues. So that's one way to sort of deplete the adipose tissue of its stored fuel and to, um, to end up losing adipose tissue mass, which is a good thing, and then end up losing weight as a result of it. Exactly, yes.